screw that for next week. <laughs> the order of service is printed before you in the service folder that you receive when you turn Today we celebrate the last Sunday of the church here, uh, Christ our King. We had the privilege of having Pastor Phil Heidner, who's the campus pastor of Wisconsin Lutheran High School, uh, to share a message from God's Word with us today. I think the service should be a familiar face. We are celebrating our Lord's Supper today, so communicants can take the opportunity to fill up a card in the back of the pew in front of you. Our opening hymn this morning, uh, one more thing. We come to the prayer of the church. I will include the uh, specific prayer. Uh, we'll pray for uh, Mr. Jim Martin, who's going to have surgery this coming Thursday at St. Luke's Hospital in Milwaukee. Now, our opening hymn is printed in the service folder. We begin with the hymn, Mo, He Comes with Clouds Descending.
confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil that I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ Jesus even when we were dead in our sins. So hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy for patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us, that we may live for you. Amen.
This is the word of the Lord. The psalm is Psalm 45, and we'll sing the verses responsibly. <laughs>
the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18. Glory be to you, O Lord. Pilate went back into the Praetorium and summoned Jesus. Yeah. Are you the king of Egypt? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or do others tell you about it? Pilate answered, Am I Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. Now my kingdom is not of here. You are king then, I don't ask. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Our next hymn is also printed in the service of the Lord. We're the same problem in many times. <laughs>
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What does your ideal leader look like? Does it look like the person in the Oval Office right now? Does it look like the previous person in the Oval Office? I know, I know. What's the best way to ruin Thanksgiving and the holiday season? Talk about politics. Thanks, Pastor Ebner. But we're talking about ideals here. What would you have in your mind as the ideal leader? Maybe that's hard to define or describe. Maybe you would imagine some kind of conglomeration of characteristics, like the charm of a Bush or a Reagan, plus the dignity of FDR, plus the fieriness of Teddy Roosevelt, plus the stature of Lincoln, plus the determination of Dr. King, plus the grace of Queen Victoria plus the hard-nosed motivational capabilities of Winston and Churchill, maybe all of those things combined. I suppose we could also say that it's hard to define and describe the ideal leader, but you kind of know it when you see it. It's the sort of person that just fills a room with persona and presence. The kind of person that commands attention and respect. The kind of person that oozes dignity and honor. You know when you see it because masses of people crowd around this kind of person. Maybe you imagine all the pomp and circumstance surrounding kings of old. Like processions of chariots and blasting trumpets, and people bowing down, and a scepter, and a crown, and a throne, and people giving thanks, and praise, and glory, and honor for this leader, this king who has a kingdom that goes on and on and on. That might be the ideal. Or how about this, for the picture of the ideal leader? Accused of multiple crimes, arrested, put on trial, yet silent before accusers when called to question, hated, rejected, despised. Instead of hand waves and handshakes, hands slapping and punching. Instead of a crown of jewels, a makeshift crown with blood seeping out of the thorns. Instead of royal robes, a robe drenched in blood. Instead of people spitting out thanks, people spitting on him. Instead of people shouting praises, people shouting crucify him. Instead of a wooden chariot carrying him for all to see and honor, a wooden cross carrying him for all to see and despise. Maybe that's not what you had in mind when you thought of the ideal leader. It's really quite the juxtaposition, isn't it? Here we are on the last Sunday of the church calendar year, Christ the King Sunday. This is a day that my former congregation in Florida just relished. We were Christ the King Church. And our grand opening Sunday 11 years ago was on... Christ the King Sunday. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that Christians live for. Yes! Give me Christ the King. This is great. And then you come to church today, and you're just running the same crown with many crowns, and, and you hear about Jesus before Pontius Pilate, about to be crucified. It's confounding, really. But you know, it was for Pontius Pilate, too. You heard the question that he asked of Jesus. So you are a king then? Is that what you're saying? Pilate knew leaders. He knew kings. He knew royalty. He was a governor in the Roman Empire. I mean, think about all the history there. The triumvirate. Julius Caesar. 
Caesar Augustus, the emperor when Jesus was born, or the current emperor, Caesar Tiberius, this worldwide global empire, the mighty Roman Empire as army, all the pomp and circumstance and wealth you could ever dream of, Pilate knew leaders. So you, Jesus of Nazareth, are a king? This just did not make sense to him. But to be fair, it didn't make sense to the Israelites either. If you ask the average Israelite, what does your ideal leader look like? They probably would talk about God's promised Messiah. But in their minds, God's promised Messiah looked a lot like the kind of stuff I was talking about just a few minutes ago. They had in their minds their ideal leader being like the glory days of David and Solomon. The good old days when, when every Israelite was flush with cash and had a whole closet full of Gucci tunics and a garage with two BMW chariots. Those good old days when a leader would just march onto the scene and overthrow the whole Roman Empire. And so when Jesus splashed onto the scene and started healing people and feeding thousands and doing miracles, they thought, yes, this is it. This is what we want. But then Jesus started warning about the Pharisees' laws and about sin and talking about a different kind of kingdom and talking about dying. And they thought, nope, that's not what we want. Crucify him. I would have to think that the people of Daniel's day had much the same confused thoughts. Rewind about 500 years of history or so, you're splitting the difference between Jesus and King David. The Israelites knew power, they saw it in the glory days of Israel, but now their kingdom was in ashes and rubble. In fact, they weren't even in their homeland. They were exiles in captivity in Babylon. The power they knew was the Babylonian army that swept them away. The leader they knew was King Nebuchadnezzar with his grand palace. And maybe you've heard of these famous hanging gardens. He allegedly built one of the ancient wonders of the world. We want some of that stuff. And so here comes Daniel with this vision in Daniel chapter 7. And he sees this vision of kingdoms, kingdoms rising and kingdoms falling, four of them. And the first one was actually the Babylonian Empire. And at the end of this vision of all of these kingdoms, of all this power, Daniel sees this other vision. And it's in fact the two verses that you heard in the first lesson this morning. Listen again to what Daniel saw at the end in chapter 7. I kept watching the night visions, and there... In the clouds of heaven, I saw one like a son of man coming. He came to the ancient of days, and he was brought before him. To him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom. And all peoples, nations, and languages will worship him. His dominion is an eternal dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. I would imagine that this left the Israelites who were in captivity just as confused as Pilate was some 500 years later. What do you mean, Daniel? One like a son of man. You mean just a regular old guy? Oh, we like this coming on the clouds of and this dominion and this power and this authority like the Psalm 45 that we sang this morning. We like that. This was the Israelite problem for centuries. Even up to the time when Jesus came, they were looking for the wrong kind of king and the wrong kind of kingdom. And so now I will ask you, what kind of Jesus are you looking for? What kind of king would you like? If you had to answer and fill in the blank, what would you say? I would finally be happy if... If what? I would finally feel good and have some peace in my heart if only... If what? If your mortgage was paid off? 
fall, your deck was gone? Did you know that you had enough to make it to or through retirement? Did you know that your kids or grandkids would be happy and successful for their entire lives? If someone actually did make America great again? If you didn't have to worry about terrorists or nuclear missiles? Or maybe if someone just took away all the arthritis or found a cure for cancer? You know, there's a reason that many TV evangelists and mega pastors sell millions of books and fill stadiums with thousands of people. Not all, but many. <laughs> Preach a Jesus that my itching ears want to hear. They preach a Christ who is a worldly king. Sometimes we call this a social gospel or a prosperity gospel. They preach about the kind of Jesus that Pilate was looking for and that the Jews so desperately wanted. But did you hear what Jesus said? He told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. It's a different kind of kingdom because he's a different kind of king with a different kind of purpose. Jesus did not come to load up your 401k or to lower gas prices or stabilize the economy or deactivate nukes. He didn't come for what sinful hearts want in a sinful world. Jesus came not for what we want, for what, but for what we so desperately need. And so here we are on this Christ the King Sunday, and our eyes go back to this scene on Good Friday with Pontius Pilate. And we see there one who is, like Daniel said, like a son of man, as Jesus called himself so often, one who is in human flesh just like the rest of us, but there, beneath that crown of thorns and that blood-stained robe and all the bruises and all the blood, there we see a king who is so loving that he would exchange the crown of heaven for that crown of thorns. There we see a king who is so merciful that he would give up a throne of glory for a cross of shame. There we see a king so gracious that he would exchange his own righteousness for all the guilt and sin of an entire world of sinners, there we see a king so powerful that he would give his life to death so that when we face death, we could have life. This is the kind of stuff that just doesn't make sense unless we are looking with our eyes of faith. The Apostle Paul said in Corinthians that to the world, this is utter foolishness. But to God... This is his great wisdom in Christ at the cross. We see Christ the King who knew the only way to win the battle would be if he entered the fray himself. The only way to overcome the enemies of death and the devil would be if he won the battle himself. The only way to have a people in his kingdom would be if he purchased and won them with his own blood. And so he did. This is the beauty of the vision that we see from Daniel today. There's two sides to this vision. The first half of this great contract, this great juxtaposition, is one who is like a son of man, a king who came and humbled himself to win for himself and his own people, bought with his blood. But then there's the other half of this vision. The Christ, the king that we often think about, the glorious, victorious king, who will come back on the clouds one day to judge the living and the dead, a king who will make every person to bow down before him, a king who has a kingdom that will not ever end, that will go on forever and ever. This is the ideal king. The king that Daniel sees, a king who gives us not what we want, but what we need, the forgiveness of sins, and joy, and peace, and hope, life everlasting. A king who loves us so much that he would go to hell and back and did to give us heaven. A king who has eternal treasures for us beyond what we could ever fathom in this world. Brothers and sisters, what a beautiful vision of Daniel today. This is the ideal king. This is our king. This is Christ the King. And 
so to him be honor, glory, thanks, and praise, now until the day he comes back with the clouds and into eternity. To him be the glory. Amen. Please stand. We join together to confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, eyes of not made, all of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world's come. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Please stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus our Lord and for all according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have revealed through created things destined for destruction a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. In these gray and latter days, set the hearts of your baptized children on what lasts and help us to be a people who truly wait with anticipation for the glorious appearing of Christ our King. He came into the world to bear witness to the truth, and he sent his own into the world with his truth. Open the mouths of all servants of your word and enable them to speak truly and boldly of Jesus and how he has loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood. Raise up ever new workers to spread your word and speak your promises. 
Christ our King is the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Remember in mercy our President and Congress and all who bear office in our land. Give them wisdom to know what is right, courage to follow it, and integrity to do so in honor. In the midst of heaven and earth that pass away, we beg you, Father, to strengthen by the words that will never pass away all who are in any affliction or trouble, heartache, or pain. We especially commend to your care this week our brother and your servant, Jim Martins, who will have surgery. Remove from him all fear and help him to look forward to the deliverance that you have waiting for him and for all in the full and final healing at the appearing of your Son. As you have been our dwelling place in all generation, receive our thanks and praise for all those who have died in faith and bring us to share with them in the splendors of the new heaven and the new earth. Into your hands, dear Lord, we commend all of whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own, to live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessings. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation and grace. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law. That he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross. That he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. body and the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in Christian faith until life everlasting. Go in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The true body and the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in Christian faith until life everlasting. Go in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus. Christian faith until life everlasting. Go in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus. Amen. Thank you.
Please stand. We join to sing the song of Simeon. Thanks, O oh Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you'll receive us as your guests forever at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Our closing hymn number 216, Saints Behold, the Sight is Glorious.